Welcome to the Revoltocene period. The Revoltocene period follows the Spinocene, lasting from 101 million years to 140 million years into the planet's history. This period is best known for the rise of Salactopods as the dominant fauna on land, relegating most invertebrates to much smaller sizes. The Revoltocene is an analog to the Permian period of Earth, as both involve terrestrial vertebrates attaining dominance and diverging further, as I'll discuss later. This is how the continents have looked throughout the Revoltocene. Tectonic activity is an all-time high as the, as the continents reshuffle themselves, with Kanmapu beginning to rotate towards Barrows. Sea levels are starting to rise once again. Although Salachopods were the dominant shark play in the Revoltocene, Euhemocillians were still very common in the ocean. The spied winghead shark bore a frequently wide head dotted with electroreceptors, vaguely similar to hammerhead sharks on Earth. It was a large predator that snapped up any shark unlucky enough to cross its path. Contrary to what its size implies, the winghead shark was quite agile due to its head shape, which allowed it to make very quick turns. The spied winghead shark was massive among you hemicillians at the time, measuring a little under 20 feet in body length, rivaling a large great white. However, it can be assumed their pups were smaller and only 2 feet upon being born. The use of Lachipod lineage diverged into clays in those the Squalosaurs and the Carcarotheres. Squalosaurs are the more superficially reptilian of the two, featuring a light skeleton and retain the archaic lizard-like build of ancestral Salachopods. Carcarotheres are more analogous to pachyderms, featuring large heads and heavy-set bodies supported by a denser skeleton and erect, pillar-like legs. This split is similar to that between sauropsids, the group including reptiles and birds, and synapsids on Earth. One of the earliest squalosaurs in the Revoltocene was the species Orctocarcaria lepus. A descendant of actual zoelatopods like Carcarosauroides, it retained its ancestors' speed and used it to great effect when chasing down arthropods. When on the hunt, Orctocarcaria would burrow into the earth to carve out a place to rest out of sight for predators. Its burrow also doubled as a nest for the squalosaur to safely lay and incubate its eggs. The maximum body length for Orctocarcaria lepus was about 5 feet, somewhat smaller than an average parenti, although long-lived individuals had the potential to reach 7 feet, counting the long tail. The freshly hatched pups of the squalosaur measured 5 inches in length. Although many early squalosaurs were small, Carcarotheres were already reaching large sizes. One of the most abundant was Squalotaurus armentum, a peaceful herbivore that instinctually traveled in small herds. Additional calcium and protein ligaments developed prior to the split allowed the Carcarotheres to support a greater body mass. It can trace its roots back to the predominantly cactus-eating Frugodracon, whose descendants optimized for a more generalized diet of plants. Squalotaurus armentum, as a Carcarotheres, was naturally one of the largest animals to walk the land around this time. Fully grown individuals could reach a little over 9 feet in length, or around the size of an American bison. Squalotaurus calves were about a foot long upon hatching. Some squalosaurs accumulated the vacuum left behind by the decline of large arthropods to become ferocious predators. Archaeophonius tenodens bore a semi erect walking gig to both support its larger body mass and allow it to run faster. All smaller than the Carcarotheres had fed on, Archaeophonius was an efficient hunter due to the strategy of using its serrated teeth to tear chunks of flesh off of its prey until the victim dies of shock and blood loss. Archaeophonius tenodens was quite large for a squalosaur of its day, reaching up to three and a half feet long, or as large as a small coyote. Its pups hatched from their eggs measuring about half a foot long before eventually reaching adult size upon sexual maturity. The Squalosaurs and Carcarotheres weren't the only Salachopods to evolve in the Revoltocene. More basal branch, the Chilocarcarids, ended up evolving to fill more specialized niches than their more derived relatives. They are notable for their pronounced lips, which gave them a duck build appearance. Unlike all other Salachopods you observed, Chilocarcarids lack any vestiges of dorsal or bottle fins altogether. Many species of Chilocarcarid lived underground, including Edaphicarcarius ruber. Much of their lives are spent tunneling through the soil in search of food, using scented barbels to feel for worms that live beneath the soil. Commonly known as mole sharks do this lifestyle, they bore enlarged foreclaws that were kept sharp by being held off the ground when not in use. Due to the relative lack of predators below the depths, Edaphicarcarius hardly needed to defend itself. 
Each Avacar carrier's Ruber was quite small among the progressively larger swallows and Karkara theirs, maxing out 60 centimeters in length when fully grown. Other Edaphacar carrier species could grow to lengths ranging from 30 to 90 centimeters. Some Kilocarcarids took a different life size from burrowing, with Lepidopil foliot evolving to a semi aquatic herbivore. Made distinct by the array of plate like tentacles growing down its back, it was the largest Kilocarcarid of the time. Although its sake build would at first glance call a hippo on Earth, Lepidopil to live the life style more akin to waterfowl as its flattened, duck-like snout was more soon mowing through aquatic plants than dealing damage like a hippo's tusks. Lepidopelta lolliot, the type species known of the genus Lepidopelta, could grow up to six feet in length, counting the tail. While this might seem unremarkable compared to some Carcarthia species, it was still gargantuan by Keenla Carcarid standards. As the Salagipods flourished, many arthropods are forced to reach smaller body sizes, Due an equal part to the drop in oxygen levels at the end of the spinosocene and competition from said salachipods. As a result, they now reach pre terranocene sizes at most, with a few exceptions here and there. If anything, this size relation will likely give them even more room to diversify. One of the most affected groups of animals by the shrinkage include the spiders. Many species, like the common Lyrusian weaver, exploited this and evolved to build intricate webs similar to orb weavers on Earth. However, as much as the spider looked and behaved like them, it was still as much of a tarantula as its distant ancestors. However, the webs were built with the same purpose in mind, ensnaring hapless prey. Lyrus and weaver webs could form vast networks in the canopy. Due to the constraints of how much their silk can support, common Lyrus and weavers typically grow to 5 centimeters in leg span and weigh 3 grams making them tiny compared to other tarantulas, especially the ones that predated in the Swallow's earlier history. Newly born spiderlings were only as big as the head of a pin. The Onychobrachids, a spider clay designed from stock like Onychobrachium, remained efficient predators in spite of their smaller size ranges. The Jade Arachnomantis has optimized further for grappling with prey, developing its forelimbs further with hook claws and spikes to rise from simple hairs. The chelicerae of the arachnomancis began to shrink as these limbs took up a more active role in catching and manipulating food. Like its namesake, its enlarged eyes granted it acute vision. Jade arachnomancises usually grow to a maximum body size of about three tenths of an inch in length, or about as long as a Reuben blackberry. Its spiderlings were the size of a raspberry droplet upon first hatching, although even in infancy, the spider's small size had no bearing on its efficiency as a predator. However, not all spider species of the Revoltocene were as inherently successful. The benign sap sippers abandoned the predatory lifestyle in favor of draining the vascular fluid of plants, much like aphids on Earth. Their fangs were used to pierce the plant's cuticles instead of delivering venom. In spite of these adaptations and a high breeding rate, these spiders went extinct over a really few thousand years due to their over-specialization for herbivory, which made them highly deficient in protein. Even among exceedingly small arthropods, the benign sap sipper was one of the smallest, growing up to one-eighth of an inch long, or about the size of the aphids they resemble. Spider legs hatch from their eggs at only a quarter of the size of adult sap sippers. The papilophines were able to retain their large sizes because their long, thin bodies decreased their surface area for oxygen absorption. Arthrophonius horribilis while unable to directly compete with many large salatopods, became a fearsome predator in its own right by invading the burrows of smaller animals, such as the mole shark Edaphacar carriers. Like its ancestors, Arthrophonius was a deadly constrictor that caught prey in its coils before slicing into them with sharpened mandibles. Arthrophonius horribilis is one of the largest arthropods of its time, measuring about three feet long despite the intense competition for salatopods. Infant Arthrophonius were considerably smaller than adults, only measuring two inches upon their birth. Among earthen brown creatures like Edaphicar carries and Arthrophonius, the brightly colored Harlequin Shriech might seem like an oddity in the underground, but it was just as well adapted for life in the tunnels. A descendant of blood sucking medicinal leeches is forsaken its vampiric ways and instead become a strewn like predator, slurping a prey in its toothless mouth. It has also developed sensory fronds ringing the mouth, 
It was a common food item of mole sharks. The harlequin's screech was quite large for a leech, reaching a little over 7 inches in length and weighing about 752 grams. Much of its length was taken up by his engorged body, while sleepers only contributed to three-tenths of an inch at most. In the more tropical regions of Squalosia, one branch of land slugs, the Viperolime acids, evolved into deadly hunters capable of injecting their prey with venomous gradually. The Kumquat Bruise Tooth was one such species, bearing bright orange aposematic coloration of more predators than is dangerous. The Groove Tooth and many other Viperolime acids developed a snake-like body shape, making them converge into the unrelated Papalophines. Much of its diet was comprised of homeless weavers. The Kumquat Groove Tooth is, to say the least, quite large for a slug, measuring 11 inches long from head to tail. Baby groove teeth, while relatively measly and only an inch long when newly born, were still avid predators and much smaller creatures due to their venomous bite. Invertebrates in the water weren't as badly affected due to water's buoyancy, placing less of a limit on size. Titan Octopus Edwardsi, in particular, was a descendant of the common octopus and a product of deep sea gigantism, lumbering about the benthic zone on six of his eight tentacles. The other two have been optimized into appendages for filtering plankton out of the water and drank into the mouth. As such, this titanic octopus was a gentle giant compared to its smaller kin. Titan Octopus Edwardsi, true to its generic name, was one of the largest, if not the largest, cephalopod to evolve during the revolt scene. At adult size, this octopus could reach a height of 15 meters, or about 50 feet. This is especially surprising when one considers that its young were only as large as gummy bears upon birth. The tropical sea beds of Squalosia Ocean were home to the Rapiantozoans, sessile descendants of the box jellyfish. proto rapiantum venenifer, while primitive compared to later species, was still no less toxic than its deadly ancestor. While it lived like an ordinary jellyfish in its larval stage, upon reaching adulthood it would nestle on a rock and remain there for its entire life. Proto Rapiantum would be best described as similar to standard anemones on Earth, or basal giant green anemones on Squalosia, for that matter. Proto Rapiantum venenifer was large for box jelly, owing to its sessile nature. Its bell alone could reach 6 inches in height, comparable to a standard beer mug. However, its free flowing larvae were far smaller by comparison, with sizes ranging from microscopic to that of a grain of sugar. As the revolt of period progressed, squalosaurs continued to diversify to a staggering degree, with many becoming efficient predators of other solatopods or arthropods. While still bound by the physiological constraints of their lizard-like anatomy, squalosaurs were nonetheless adaptable enough to fill niches that unavailable to the relatively sluggish carcarotheres, which were more specialized. One clay of squalosaurs to evolve near the end of the period was the family Gygognathidae. Gygonathans like Phobodens terribilis were bulky, yet deceptively fast predators that hunted large prey, although they fed from carcasses when pickings were slim. The teeth of Phobodens were shaped like railroad spikes, augmenting its already powerful bite and after crunching the cartilaginous bones of its meals. In this way, it was essentially the hyena of the revolt scene. Phobodens terribilis measured up to 5 feet in length when fully grown, a bit longer than a large rottweiler. Although not much larger than its ancestor Archaeophonius, the added bulk of Phobodens made it more robustly built and its more erect gait allowed it to stand taller. Other squalosaurs retained the lizard like body shapes of basal varieties, but became specialized for feeding on small prey. Schalter's Groundra had well developed foreclaws and armored denticles suited for a diet of Myrmecomimids, but she picked off one by one like a horned lizard would a swarm of harvester ants. The groundless denticles also gave an intimidating appearance, which it could use to scare off predators in the event that its natural camouflage fails. Schalter's groundra exhibited size variations that appear those of beer dragons, growing between 16 and 24 inches long from snout to tail. The groundra's pups hatched from their eggs measuring 3 inches in length before gradually reaching adult size. With the recession of much of the Pattaya forest during the Stapian extinction event of the Spinosa scene, other plant species, like the scents of peppers, lettuce, and cranberries, had taken the opportunity to fill the role of large trees in South Lyruza. Although they were sparse in relation to the groves in North Lyruza and Kenmapu, 
due to the more arid climate. Speaking of North Lyruza and Kanmapu, the few continents have become developed a climate similar to tropical rainforests on Earth due to the naturally high levels of precipitation and humidity, as well as foraging tree growth. This latch upon for the dominant land animals of the revolt scene and continue to assume this role well into the present day. While much of the Salachapod population is composed of skull and sores and carcarid theirs, Gila carcarids also managed to claim niches wherever they could to avoid competition. Many arthropods and other invertebrates saw a trend of size reduction following the Snapian extinction event and the conquest of the Salachapods, although many groups like the Trosopapalonids and Onica brackets continue to thrive. Some clays that remained large include the Papalophines, Viper lamacids, and many clays of aquatic vertebrates. Note that this video doesn't detail everything about the Revolta scene, only the aspects and creatures most relevant to the planet's history. If you don't understand what I just showed you all, you can always access the Google Docs, Forecast, or Discord for the project for more detailed information. The links are posted in the description. If you have any questions pertaining to the project, I will gladly answer them to the best of my ability in the comment section. On the next episode, we'll delve into the Mastrocene period, where life on Squalloza starts to become more bizarre, more breathtaking, and more nightmarish.